I'm so excited to introduce you to Dr. Sun, who is um, a creative, inspirational, and innovative leader in our field. As I told you before break, um, this was to be a larger panel, and we are just now with our gift, our one single solitary diamond, here to talk about his work, his innovative pathways forward to decriminalize mental illness. Dr. Sun. Thank you, Melissa. All right. Can people hear me? Great. Well, Melissa, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, great to see everyone again. This is my second summit. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to Montez. So Montez is a proud grandmother of five and volunteers at the local food bank. Um, she loves taking care of her grandkids, taking them to the zoo. Um, and uh, if you're here for last year's Pecha Kucha, you would know that her guilty pleasure is Taco Bell. Um, if you met Montez today, you would not know that she's in recovery from schizophrenia and cocaine addiction, and that she's been the subject of over 100 911 calls, uh, that she's experienced homelessness uh, and has spent over 200 days in the hospital. And unfortunately, due to her untreated mental illness, um, she's been repeatedly incarcerated. So I share Montez's journey uh, to illustrate the multiple system failures across the health, housing, and criminal justice systems, while also offering hope that it is possible for recovery with the appropriate supports. Now, I'm here today to talk about uh, how the private sector can play a critical role in helping us deliver better holistic care. So how do we build a world where severe mental illness is not a diagnosis of doom, where people can thrive and flourish in our community rather than being inappropriately incarcerated? Well, um, it comes down to the three Ps, right? If Tom Insel were here today, he would tell you about uh, people, place, and purpose. Um, and we'll be talking about a fourth P today, which is about how the private sector um, can help with payment. Um, and I'll make sure to weave uh, the fourth P into our examples. So everything um, I'll talk about today will be uh, evidence-based practices around the three Ps. Um, and so um, the first P is people, right? Social support, having a sense of belonging, being connected to people that breaks the isolation that is so common for people with severe mental illness. The second P is purpose, um, having something that you care deeply about, something that brings meaning to you. And for Montez, this is spending time with her grandkids, right? volunteering at the local food bank, and being part of a clubhouse, which is an evidence-based practice that is centered around people and purpose. Now, um, what you see here is a typical clubhouse um, where it's a, it's a day center run by people with severe mental illness for people with severe mental illness. And so this is a very intentional therapeutic uh, environment where the focus is recovery. People can come together, hang out, create art, cook, and eat together, um, and just be seen for who they are rather than the mental illness uh, diagnosis that's often associated with people. And um, for people who want to work, there are a lot of jobs that need to be done in a clubhouse. So if someone wants to work, they get on-site training. And if people want to get um, employment outside, there is uh, some clubhouses who offer supported employment. Um, so there's a really nice way for people to integrate into the community. Now, when people are connected to uh, a community, like a clubhouse, and they have purpose, uh, there are dramatic reductions in recidivism. So clubhouse programs across the country are associated with five to 10-fold reductions in recidivism, right? 
Um, and they're also associated with reductions in emergency room visits, hospitalizations. Um, and yet, unfortunately, Medicaid doesn't pay enough for psychosocial rehab programs like the clubhouse. And so, unfortunately, only uh, about 5% of people with severe mental illness actually get these really essential psychosocial rehab services. And so this is where the private sector can come in. Uh, I'd love to tell you about uh, Vana Health. So they're an early stage company that's really focused on supporting people with behavioral health needs to thrive and flourish uh, in our community. And so the private sector, uh, the theme that I'd like to introduce today is that it, it, they're really uniquely positioned to provide upfront funding and um, spend that funding in a flexible way. And so Medicaid doesn't pay for psychosocial rehab services as much. Wavana well, Health will raise private sector funding, right, and test this hypothesis of providing psychosocial rehab services um, and then create a sustainable business model where you can reduce healthcare costs, help people thrive, um, and then prove the innovative payment model needed to really support this vulnerable population. Okay, and so the third P is place, right? A place to call home stable housing. And so um, Montez uh, unfortunately lost her apartment um, when she was convinced that her neighbors uh, were casting voodoo spells on her. And she got into a physical fight, which resulted in a, in a pretty long psychiatric hospitalization. And um, she wasn't able to pay her rent and then uh, became homeless. Uh, and after that, uh, was incarcerated for uh, stealing food. And so um, I share this journey because um, you know, we, we do have evidence-based practices that can prevent uh, you know, a journey like this. And so um, the other evidence-based practice I wanna share is, is um, supportive housing, right? Housing first. Um, and this is a combination of deeply affordable housing with the wraparound services to help people uh, thrive, achieve um, health, physical health, mental health, and also maintain housing stability. Um, and this is just really uh, you know, core to the third P, right, place for people. Um, and for Montez, she needed uh, pretty intensive services, um, and this came in the form of assertive community treatment, which I'm a psychiatrist uh, on such a um, mobile team, so this is a team of inter interdisciplinary specialists uh, that include a psychiatrist, a mental health therapist, an addiction counselor, a housing specialist, a vocational specialist, who all meet patients where they are in the community um, to help people thrive uh, in the community. And so, as you can imagine, these are pretty expensive services, right? And so, this is, again, where Medicaid pays for some of this, but just not enough to meet the need. Um, and again, so this is where the private sector can come in to, to help provide that upfront capital and the flexibility to, to help people stay housed. And so that can come in the form of a social impact bond, right? Which is really fundamentally about paying for better outcomes. Um, and a great example comes through the work of Corporation for Supportive Housing, CSH, uh, which helped uh, Denver raise a social impact bond for Housing First, right? And so what happened was they um, were able to recruit investors to bring upfront funding, which then created two new assertive community treatment teams, right? And there was flexible funding to help people stay housed, pay for furniture, deposit, last month's rent, all these things that healthcare dollars aren't supposed to pay for. Um, and uh, if this demonstration was able to produce better outcomes in terms of reduced jail days, and increased housing stability, the city of Denver will reward the investors um, by paying them more than what they put in, right? So effectively um, paying uh, interest on the social impact bond. Um, and so through this tremendous work, um, the results were uh, outstanding. So um, for this very, very high needs population, which you know the existing systems were just too overwhelmed to support, 
um, they were able to demonstrate 30% reductions in jail days. And um, at year three, almost 80% of the participants uh, were stably housed. And this is just like, you know, um, some of the best results uh, in the field. And so this is a great example of the public and private sectors coming together um, to help people thrive in the, in the community. Now, the challenge is uh, social impact bonds take years to construct, often multiple years. Um, and there have been demonstrations around the country. Um, and so how do we do this faster, right? So um, another good example of this is United Healthcare. So they are one of the country's largest for-profit health plans. Um, and um, you know, they just have the capacity to say, hey, we believe in housing first, um, and we will fund right, housing, rent from our profits, right? So things that you can't do with Medicaid dollars. Um, and because of their scale, you know, they were able to just roll this out in over 12 cities. Um, and so this is really truly a unique thing that, that really the only private sector can do. All right, so we've heard about the three Ps, right? People, place, and purpose. And I've weaved in some of the uh, payment models, right? The fourth P needed to make this work. And now the challenge is, how do we get to scale and sustainability? And so this is something that I'd really like to spend our um, question and answer uh, time on and invite the audience to, to think together on. Um, because this is really the, the challenge, right? We know what works. Three Ps, how do we deliver this at scale? Um, and so this is really fundamentally about paying for better outcomes, right? Um, so we've already uh, demonstrated that local governments can pay for better outcomes through social impact bonds. Um, you know, thankfully in Denver, that actually converted into a uh, government contract that didn't require investors, but they continue to pay for better outcomes in reduced jail days um, and increased housing days. Um, and so um, this is extremely, extremely difficult um, and, and probably will be very hard to do for everyone, but I'd like to make a case for um, uh, people with severe mental illness and, and behavioral health costs. And so what you see here are um, the total costs across health, housing, and the criminal justice systems. Um, and three bars represent uh, different housing status. So whether someone with severe mental illness is uh, receiving housing first, uh, living in their own apartment, or experiencing chronic homelessness, what you see is the majority of the costs are colored blue, which represents healthcare uh, spend. And this is both physical and uh, behavioral health uh, care costs. And for people with severe mental illness, this represents a um, $40 billion healthcare spend every year. And so here is where there's an opportunity to create a sustainable business model, right? Where um, basically um, you need to create a virtuous cycle where the more money you put in, uh, the better outcomes you get. And the key thing is you need to have leftover money so that you can expand the services to more people, right? And so this is really just the only way to get to scale in a sustainable way. And in, in these blue bars, um, uh, I, I, I think there's a very good case that we can do this. Um, and if you just double click on uh, the healthcare dollars, the majority of them are uh, in hospital visits, right? So emergency room visits, physical health hospitalizations, psychiatric hospitalizations, and these are all, um, can be, they, they can't all be prevented, right? But with holistic care, right, by providing the three Ps, uh, we can reduce and prevent a lot of these very, very expensive um, hospital visits. And, and that is really the thesis uh, that I'm hoping to um, put out today and, and would love to get people's feedback on. And so, um, so, so getting to, to scale and sustainably is, is, is extremely challenging. And, and so in partnership with Corporation for Supportive Housing and thanks to the support from SOSOSA, we've just launched a knowledge network where we've recruited stakeholders across the health, 
housing and criminal justice systems, all guided by people with lived experience. Um, and this is a very hands-on, um, you know, shared problem-solving forum where you know, people can come together, solve real-world problems, break down these barriers, um, establish these public-private partnerships, um, and ultimately um, change the way government pays for outcomes, uh, because I think that's just going to be critical to, to getting to scale and sustainability. So if you're interested in our work, please email me, and I look forward to connecting with you. Thank you. I'll get Anna out. Z, thank you so much for that. Uh, Z's going to be joined on stage by Anna Bob. Many of you know Anna. She is the principal and founder of Redveld Strategies and an expert in healthcare policy, and she'll lead some Q&A. Z. Thank you so much for that inspiring talk, and welcome to our audience. Welcome to our um, audience here, as well as our Whova audience. We're so glad to have you, and we hope you had wonderful Thanksgivings um, and had very uh, stimulating conversations with your families. And we really want to have a stimulating conversation here today. So um, if you're on Whova, feel free to start sending your questions in, and we are going to be taking them. I'm going to start with a couple of questions for you, Z, if that's OK. Um, I think there's a lot of people in this audience who have devoted their lives to you know, mission first and the nonprofit sector. Why do we, why do we even need private capital? What, why do we need it? Yeah, I, I, I worry that when the question is framed that way, it's, it almost feels like it's separate. Um, and so. Um, if we just look at the world around us in communities where um, you know, we're really helping people thrive and flourish, there is already embedded in it, right? Private sector players, Absolutely. public players. Um, and so what I was hoping to convey today is that the, the private sector offers some things, you know, there's certain attributes of the private sector that can really help us achieve the scale and sustainability that's needed. Um, and so that's really around upfront financing, right? When the public sector nonprofits are really um, anchored to their budgets, it's really hard to, to do uh, the innovative and flexible things needed to, to really move the needle. Um, and, and, and so um, the other piece is the scalability, right? Um, how do we build this virtuous cycle, right? Where um, the more money you put in, the better outcomes you get, and there's leftover money to scale. And I think that's just something that's fundamental to the private sector um, that is in collaboration with uh, local organizations and, and public partners. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, what struck me from your talk is that we have these discrete services that work for people with mental illness, ACT teams, clubhouse model, supportive housing, and they work extremely well um, in each one, and they also work even better almost as a you know, a cocktail, if you will, of these services. Um, you've already established proof of concept. You know these services change lives. Um, and so your challenge, as you've framed it out, is the same challenge any innovator has. Your, your challenges are really capital, and your challenges are scale. And we're really focused on how does change happen in these entrenched legacy systems. Um, again, you know, looking at scale, have you seen and I think you started to talk about this example, but have you seen a state or locale really make that transition from just demonstration or pilot to really doing something at scale? Yeah, so, so this is exactly uh, the question, so thank you for that. So um, we, I, I've started the conversation with the Denver Social Impact Bond, right? And so that, by definition, is a time-limited investment, so five years, money goes in, and then five years after, the money leaves, right? So um, the change that happened there, right, was um, the city learned how to pay for outcomes. And so for their criminal justice and housing contracts, they you know, expect better outcomes now. And that's a big part of helping people uh, thrive in the community and then to make the appropriate investments in things like housing. Um, Another place where I, I've seen this uh, work really well is um, actually the Los Angeles County Flexible Housing Pool. 
And so this is a great example of, um, you know, it took a lot of courage and upfront capital, actually thanks to the philanthropy community. So the Hilton Foundation invested, um, you know, tremendous amount um, uh, to start this flexible housing pool, which, you know, is, is now trying to be replicated across the country. Um, and, and this is where, um, you know, almost all the money up front was philanthropy funded. Uh, and again, this is where it's like, you do the demonstration, you help the public sector expect better outcomes, you see that it works, and then it's like, um, it's taken root. Um, and so, you know, it's this remarkable story of scale. Um, LA, of course, is the largest county in the country, um, but they went from, you know, placing a dozen or so people, um, you know, in the first year to five years later, even in the middle of COVID, placing uh, 10,000 people. And so this is the exponential growth of things that you typically only see in the private sector. Um, but that's a good example of how, um, you know, LA really needed um, the upfront capital from philanthropy and then was able to uh, replace all of it to just fully sustainable public funds. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I think Patrick Kennedy said yesterday that um, what we want to get to is insurance paying for the social determinants. And I think that that is such a lofty goal and something I think probably a lot of people in this audience are really would love to see happen. What's the distinction, though? And I think you kind of you kind of you talked about the business model, but what's the distinction with your program? It's it's not paying for all social determinants, but what's the business model distinction with your program that should I think demonstrate that it's really quite a bit feasible, more feasible and more in reach than sort of full scale, you know, reinvention of the of the medical system. Yeah, I think I think this conversation um, gets framed. Um, with kind of like the old world in mind, right? So when people say, oh, health plans, healthcare shouldn't be paying for um, social determinants, um, it's almost like speaking about it as if it's another item on the fee-for-service schedule where the more you provide you know, housing, the more you'll just give housing to everyone. Um, but I, I think what's really exciting, and, and again, this comes back to fundamentally paying for outcomes and getting rewarded for it, um, you know, in this, in this new uh, value-based model, this, this next um, healthcare reform where you're moving away from just paying for volume for services, but actually becoming responsible, right, for individuals, their outcomes, their costs. Um, and so um, social determinants, of course, are a huge um, piece of that, and so, um, you know, it is, um, provider organizations that really um, work with public sector entities that, that then provide these resources. And in some cases, right, um, you can use healthcare dollars to help people maintain housing, right, like ACT Teams uh, supports, right. In, in some innovative states, you can actually use healthcare dollars to pay for the first month's rent um, or, you know, carpet cleaning if it results in, um, if someone has asthma, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is how I think the social determinants uh, will become um, paid for because um, w when an organization is fundamentally um, accountable for a population's outcomes and costs, it, it just is like a no-brainer to, yeah. to really work with um, the social determinant um, kind of providers. And we've seen this before in healthcare and we've tried to get prevention rolled in. and. and but th what's di what I saw in your presentation is you put out a $40 billion you know, market that you defined here. And so that really starts to become something that um, is, you know, we talk about innovation in Medicaid, but that can actually happen when you're talking about $40 billion you're working with. We, you are starting to line people up, Z. So I want to turn, I'm going to just turn to the audience and ask for a couple questions, um, if you will. Nancy? Yes. Hi. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Nancy McGraw from CSH. So I'm. I already believe in supportive housing. Just, just to <laughs> be frank. Um, but I. What I think is so fascinating is that chart with the bars, right? And you have the three different level, three different interventions, if you would. I wouldn't even call. You know. Housing. Uh, yes. Housing yeah. is the intervention. Where do people live? Um, uh, the jail should not be the intervention, 
Right. right. That's really, and the hospital should not be the intervention. And I think that those charts really show that. What I think um, we're all learning through this work is um, the silos within government, the silos within the public sector, the silos within our service industry. So um, thinking about how do you get to the people that can bridge? So is it the OMB office within a, a city or a state? Is it the investment officer at a healthcare? Like who are the right people that can, can create that different trajectory? Yeah, uh, this is the hard work I think everyone uh, is already doing in this room. So, um, so, so I, I like to think about this in, in both um, what does the collaboration look like at the balcony level, right? So state, county, city, across health, housing, and the criminal justice system, uh, as well as like on the dance floor, right? So between providers, um, you know, SDOH uh, partners, um, members, people, um, and so it, I think it just really comes together through um, you know both balcony level work and dance floor work, and um, you know CSH I'll just give a plug here does the balcony level work right where they um, help facilitate as a third party neutral um, facilitator um, that you know funds can route through uh, they can bring together the health, housing, and criminal justice uh, decision makers, right, in a very um, unbiased way. Um, and then on the dance floor, you know, this is something I covered a little bit um, in my Pecha Kucha last year, um, but it's really about evidence-based practices that bridge these systems, right? Um, and so you've already heard about housing first, uh, which, you know, is, is housing plus services, and so it naturally bridges housing and the healthcare system. Um, and what's really nice about that Denver social impact bond, right, is, is you know, they only enroll people who have uh, criminal justice records. And so, you know, by definition, you're kind of already intersecting with the criminal justice system. Um, I'll give a plug for assertive community treatment. So this is the high intensity services that Montez really benefited from. There is a form of that um, that collaborates with the criminal justice system, right? So um, you heard from judges this morning. Um, there are drug and mental health court judges that, um, um, that, that um, offer treatment as an alternative to punishment um, and, and also probation and parole officers where people with um, you know, have been traumatized by the criminal justice system need um, specialized care. And so there are adaptations of these assertive community treatment community teams that really know how to collaborate with um, judges and probation parole officers. And, and so that's, th this is the challenge, right? How do you implement in a collaborative way? Um, and, and that is just the hard work that I think everyone here already um, uh, uh, understands and appreciates. Do you wanna take a question from this side? I was also intrigued by your uh, bar chart there, and, and I'm a former financial analyst, and I just saw you had sort of $70,000 a year to have somebody be homeless in terms of all-in costs and $50,000 if you give them a roof. Right. So that's a 35% plus potential return if, yep. for, for if you could kind of package it as, mm -hmm. I don't know, a financial prospect. So is there any, I don't know, movement to just say, well, we've got a pool of homeless people in our, in our town, city, what mm -hmm. have you. Uh, if you can figure out a way, I don't know what it is, but to get that cost to become lower, you can mm -hmm. share in that cost, you know, the, the savings will become your potential reward. Right. Is there anything sort of straightforward that's been done to sort of create a, a pool of, you know, find us a better way, you figure it out. Right. It involves getting people homes yeah. and make a profit. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give the, the public sector answer to that and then kind of where healthcare is trying to move. So um, what, what you describe is exactly what, what it took to convince LA County, right? So um, it required philanthropy to, to pay for housing, right? And then they measured, oh my gosh, all these county healthcare services are, are reduced. And so a big part of the sustainable financing is actually coming out of the LA County Health Department, not from the housing department, right? And so that is where, um, you know, where you can actually transition, right, from, from pilot to scale. Um, and so that, 
that return on investment um, calculus was done by the county, and you know I'm hopeful to see that they will continue to um, scale to the next order of magnitude, right? Tens of thousands of people. Um, on the private sector side, I think this is exactly um, uh, you know, companies like Vana Health are trying to do, right? They're really laser focused on people with specific needs, so in this case, severe mental illness, and providing something that just really helps that population thrive and flourish, right? And so um, I, I think it's pretty um, contrarian to use healthcare dollars to pay for like people and purpose, right? Like, you know, that's just not on the standard healthcare uh, fee schedule. <laughs> Um, and so by taking full financial responsibility for a, a, a very specialized population, that's where you can have all the shared savings be reinvested in the community services, right? Where instead of 5% of people getting these psychosocial rehabilitative services, you know, you really expand that to like half, two thirds. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It does, I guess, just in terms of structuring the, I don't know, the contract, if you will. Mm -hmm. Has there been sort of, you know, here's the, you know, you have different privatization initiatives, and this would be one where you say, you know, we don't care how you do it, but yeah. you know, the cost to us has been X per person. Right. You can make it X minus 20%, you know, is a right. potential for you to, to go do it. So that's a cautionary tale, actually. So, um, uh, you know, this is uh, before my time, but um, uh, the previous wave, right, the, the value-based reimbursement uh, trend that's going on now, the previous version of that is exactly what you propose, which is you give upfront money to health plans or providers, and then you let them do what you think they do best, right? But unfortunately, and this is really um, a consequence of the private sector, right, is that um, the best way to save money is to withhold care, right? And to give bad quality care, right? And that's obviously unacceptable. And so I think this is what fundamentally this current healthcare reform is about. It's, hey, can we move towards flexibility where we give you some upfront money, but you have to guarantee that you meet certain quality measures where you do provide people with primary care, where you do follow up after someone has been hospitalized. Um, and if you don't meet those metrics, you actually don't get you know, a big chunk of your money. And that's, that's, that is an ongoing experiment. Uh, yeah. uh, but I, I, I think there's, a, again, so the case I'm making is if you focus and yeah. not try to boil the ocean, you can actually make this work. And Unfortunately, there's enough people with severe mental illness, right, where you could actually do this at scale. And Z, I just want to add here that, I mean, for other diseases, we're, we already do that. We already specialize. We yeah. coordinate specialty services. We spend more on sick people. Um, I mean, I think for two reasons. One, because we, we want to care for them. And the other reason is because, to your point, that's how you, you know, how you prevent disease and how you help the disease outcome be better, but also how you, and ultimately it saves money. You're always gonna be saving money if you're intervening earlier and finding the disease earlier, and you're gonna be preventing people from needing expensive health services, and more importantly, keeping them healthy. So what I, th I mean, what I do wanna kind of bring to this conversation is the fact that for mental illness, it's just different. We, you know, I mean, I think Patrick Kennedy brought this up yesterday, I mean, why, um, you know, as for an example, housing first, you know, we know it works um, and we, we can prove that it works at scale, but then when it gets to true financial sustainability, I think what people are uncomfortable with is that they don't want to house people forever. But again, if you look at the financials on that, it's not that different from treating, you know, treating a common, common chronic condition for, for life for a long time. So what's our, what's the hold up there and, and how do you see a way around that? Yeah, I think what you're pointing out is, you know, unfortunately, just like the bias, right? We're like, we have to prove ourselves. Like, why? No, like, yeah. we, should, we should have parity, right? Right. Um, but I, I think, unfortunately, the, 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 the interventions, right, for people who have severe mental illness, it, it's, it's the, the solution is not medical. It's not. It's social. Right. Um, and so that's where it becomes challenging, you know, when you are... Um, developing a, a life-saving drug, right, mm -hmm. then of course you want to provide this to as many people as possible. But like you said, once you're going into like helping people thrive and flourish, right, to, to reduce their mental suffering, um, it's not just a pill. It's 
So Absolutely. And the financial sustainability model may look different, too. It may not only in include the medical spend, but it may include these other spends and these other systems. Right. Is that, and that's sort of what you are saying happened in L.A., I think. That's right, yeah. So, so again, through a public-private partnership, um, people were able to come together, show the ROI, um, and then have it be you know, sustainable in, in the state county budget. Right. So Ken Zimmerman, do you have a question for Z? I do. <laughs> and, uh, Ken Zimmerman, the CEO of Fountain House, and Z, thank you very much. And I thank for the shout out for clubhouses and obviously seeing psychosocial rehabilitation on the screen is always a good thing. So thank you for all that. And I assume folks are familiar with Fountain House as a clubhouse with 2,000 members and actively engaged in much of what Z has been talking about. Um, whether it's about thinking about new financial models, whether thinking about how our members, people with serious mental health conditions, are focused on creating what it means to thrive. So two points that I'd love to just get your reactions on. First of all, I just think it's great to have the word thrive on the screen. I mean, the, the tyranny of soft expectations for what the system should be um, strikes me as being one of the real challenges that we have. And so much of what you've talked about um, uh, is about thriving and how do we get there. So the first is just about the metrics that we use. One of the challenges, it seems, is that naturally when we think about where the savings are, they're frequently about reducing hospitalizations, reducing homelessness, reducing reincarceration. Um, and, you know, in a place where 40% of our members have been unsheltered, 25% have been in the criminal justice system, part of what we're thinking about is how do we move the metrics from simply avoiding the negative outcomes to identifying what it is that are the conditions of thriving. How do we overcome loneliness? How do we ensure that people are living their best lives? And in the course of this, I'd love to get your reactions to how do we start defining what are the metrics that should be used so they are incorporated in the financial models that we have? So that, that's question one. Question two is really to invite you to talk about the public-private partnership, not just in the specifics of what we're doing, but in remaking the conversation that needs to take place. I mean, part of what strikes me as being exciting about what you're doing is we're talking about an entirely different way that we finance what is going on with people with serious mental health conditions, that value-based care, outcome-driven things, the idea that it's not social determinants of health. We're talking about health as a key outcome determinant that if people are serious about improving health care and using our dollars effectively should be incorporated into that. Now, for any private sector, folks look at what gets said and assumes that there may not be credibility because of the profit motive that's there. And it strikes me that one of the key things that sometimes exists is that the nonprofit sector, the advocacy sector, can provide the credibility that comes with folks who are in it for different reasons, can join in seeing the insights, and view it as a collective enterprise to fundamentally shift what the basics are of what we're aiming at. And so my, it's really an invitation how you think about public-private partnerships in that realm as well. So metrics and then the potential for public-private partnerships. Wonderful, yeah, thank you so much, Ken. And, and you know, Fountain House is such an inspiration to me and this is really where I started to see and meet people, right, who can, can thrive and flourish, right? It's not really about, I mean, we should reduce suffering, but like you said, how do we help people thrive and flourish? And I, I think it's really through um, communities, right, the three Ps, people, place, and purpose, um, because, you know, a visit with a psychiatrist is, is not going to help you thrive fully. Um, and so in terms of um, how do you quantify that, I mean, this, this, is, this speaks to the fundamental challenge that we are facing, which is there are indirect benefits, right? So when we think about the total cost of care in terms of health care, um, even across housing in the criminal justice system, by investing in behavioral health care, right, you get benefits in these other sectors, right? Um, same thing, right? By helping people thrive and flourish, right, you actually see improvements in these other domains. And so, um, you know, healthcare has like patient satisfaction as part of, uh, you know, like a quality measure now. And um, I am seeing, uh, especially 
um, around the country, there are specialized health plans for people with severe mental illness because they're, um, this is clearly a business case and, and to provide specialized services. And in those health plans, the quality measures are quality of life. Um, and you know, there are um, um, surveys that are specifically designed to quantify recovery. Um, and it's, it's, you know, like, you know, it's like, how do you then tie that to payments, right? It's really about how do you tie payments to outcomes, and I think that's mm -hmm. fundamental. Mm -hmm. So the second question is about, um, I just love that phrase, uh, it's a shared enterprise, mm -hmm. right? And so, like I was alluding to earlier when Anna asked the question, it, it's, a, it's a false divide, mm -hmm. um, because this is a shared enterprise, right? We are a community. And you know, if we trace where the dollars come from, like, okay, you can see that there's public and private. Um, but it is absolutely a shared enterprise. And so um, you, you know, the, the challenge is like, there are these silos, right, that provide specialized services. And you know, the more specialized you get, the, the more siloed things get. And so if we think about it as a shared enterprise, um, that's really how we, we, we form the bridges. And I, and I think that's where just going to where the money is, right? Each silo has their own budget, mm -hmm. and so it doesn't reward collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where, you know, organizations like Corporation for Supportive Housing, it's like they have, they have really developed an evidence-based practice to do like the balcony level systems um, uh, collaboration that's needed to, to, to build a shared enterprise. I just, I just wanted to add one thing, and I think part of the reason why this conversation and the work hopefully all of us are doing collectively is so important, is that in the criminal justice realm, um, there was a serious effort, what was called justice reinvestment. It's actually not all that different. There's a lot of wasted money. Um, the idea that if you could actually only deal with incarceration for those who needed it, you could reinvest the money. And it largely did not happen. The reinvestment didn't happen. The cutting back on needed services sometimes happened. And so it's just a cautionary tale, and part of the reason why everybody needs to be present in it is that there are savings, but as you said, sometimes if what is incentivized are savings, the reinvestment of those savings never happens in the way that you want. And I think that's one of the great challenges of thinking about how collectively we can take it on and use the opportunity that you're affording going forward. Right, and that's where the balance, right, between the public and private sector comes in. Uh, you know, you can't have unconstrained, um, you know, capitalism, right? There needs to be um, regulations, guideposts to be put in place, right? And, and again, you see this again and again. So you cite um, the, the justice reinvestment. You know, we, we saw this play out in healthcare, right? That you need to have some guardrails. Um, and, and ultimately, right, it, it comes down to the leaders at these organizations, the, the, the culture and the values and the fabric of these organizations, because it's people who make these decisions, right? Um, and so um, I, I think it's just so important uh, to be, to, to have values, um, you know, when you work with the private sector to really make sure you're working with a partner who has aligned values. I agree. And it's also just you're, you're creating this new market. And so the idea that you're just thinking totally differently comes through that, you know, you're blowing up these ways, these kind of, you know, traditional ways we think about healthcare and how we have to create change in healthcare, which makes it, I think, exciting. So, um, you know, I, um, well, we have lots of questions coming in from our online audience. Um, Rob, do you want to ask a question as well? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Rob Waters from Mindsight News. So it, it strikes me that one of the, you know, principal, from a private sector point of view, one of the principal beneficiaries of reducing those costs would be health insurers, and it speaks to why United Health put money into, into housing. But because of insurance churn and because, you know, if you provide something to somebody today, tomorrow they may be a member of a different health plan, um, it, that seems like it's a big impediment, right? So I'm wondering, are there ways that you're devising to like pool that investment and the risk and the benefit um, so that insurers would be more willing um, or even be forced um, to, to, to pay in for these kinds of prevention ideas? Well, yeah. The wrong pockets problem. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I think it, it just um, aligns to the theme of like, um, when is market competition like now adversely affecting you know what what we can do as a solution and so 
That is, that, is, that is why, right, the people with severe mental illness, despite the high cost you saw on the, on the graphs, health plans largely have not invested in this population because, right, in a year, two years, they would um, no longer be, you know, getting revenue from these folks and, you know, a very uh, perverse way to view this too, right, once they're in, incarcerated, they don't have to pay for their health care, right? And so I, I think um, as we think about scale and sustainability, um, the nice thing is you know, we have 50 different states. So there are 50 different um, variations, natural experiments that are happening. And um, I think having a place where there are fewer, there's still competition to, to drive innovation, to drive better products, services. But that balance of not having too much where people just don't make an investment, um, you know, I'll highlight Arizona is actually a, a great example of this where um, there is a single health plan that is dedicated to people with severe mental illness. And so there's just no churn there. There's no concern that, um, you know, a member will then become part of a next health, health plan. And so you, you can make the necessary investments in that community. I think that's really, um, you know, the long-term solution, right, is if you have the conviction to make a place-based investment, right? Um, you will be rewarded in the long term, right? And, and again, I think this is the, the courage um, that's needed from the private sector to make a place-based investment, right? Um, and to, to, to invest in the preventative services, mm -hmm. partnering with the social determinants of health uh, issues, right? And, and, and making that long-term investment. But I guess I'm, I'm asking on a policy level, is there a way to sort of require health insurers, even if they're competing with each other, to yeah. put funding into these kinds of, mm -hmm. of in long, longer term investments that may not pay off next year while your yep. member is still your member. Yeah, so the, the flexible housing pools that we've referenced today, that, that is exactly how it works. So, you know, in LA, there's this big county Medicaid plan, but in other geographies, there are multiple health plans. And so that's what they do, they, they pitch in money, so it's a blended pool, and then they reward it based on needs. Um, and so that is a way to, um, you know, financially uh, uh, require, you know, buy-in, if you will. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a, um, you know, if we were to wave a magic wand, right, it would be, no matter what health plan you're part of, right, you are accountable for costs and outcomes. And so the, the challenge is, like, how do you then assign benefits and, and, you know, cost savings and, um, you know, adverse outcomes. And, and, and that, that is the, like the implementation challenge. I want to come back to the magic wand because yeah. we want you to wave the magic <sighs> wand and tell us where we're ultimately going. I do want to, I do want to kind of take this question that just came up on Whova because I think it really is, is kind of focusing what we're talking about where, you know, it's not just healthcare system dollars that we're talking about. Now we're talking about cross system dollars. So this question really looks just at healthcare system dollars. Let's, Let's look at this and maybe we can tease some of that out. How do we make a payment system change that recognizes people, patients, and the value of direct services while also providing the demanded profit margins for managed care companies? I think you've, you've answered that with your, your market size, um, but I think payment system changes. Is, it, is that what we need to do? Do we need to change the payment system or do we need to change contracting, for instance? Are there different ways of thinking about how we get from pilot to complete sustainability that maybe isn't only through reimbursement codes and payment changes? Yeah, so going back to paying for outcomes, right? That's just another word for accountability. So um, we need a payment system that, uh, that, that enforces accountability, right? Where um, the, the value of direct services, right, are rewarded for providing higher quality care, right? Um, and um, with that accountability, um, the, the benefit and the trade-off one should get is flexibility, right? Like um, there's a balance between being too prescriptive and not you know, putting enough guide rails in, in place. And so um, I think that comes, comes down to uh, accountability. And you know, whatever financial instruments you need to do that, um, you know, I'll just go back to the magic wand. It's like, we've talked a lot about healthcare today. Um, and you know, the nice thing is there, there are these healthcare payment mechanisms where 
um, you can recover shared savings, right? So how do you provide a high touch service um, and pay for it uh, while also making sure you can expand that service, right? So, so you um, provide better outcomes and now you can scale that service to more people. But how do you do that in the housing and the criminal justice system, right? So um, uh, I alluded to this a little bit, um, which is then, you know, uh, if, if health plans pay for health care, you know, right, the local government, right, pays for uh, the criminal justice system and the housing, right? And so the question becomes, how do you then truly braid or blend, right, on, on a accountability, like, basis for specific people across these three systems? And I think that, that magic wand uh, mm. solution will be, I think, a great first step to, to actually doing that. But it's just, there's nothing in place for that. And again, this is my um, vote, uh, um, call to action for the private sector to, to, to have that courage to actually do this, um, because I think something very magical will happen. Um, I think we're reaching the, the end of our time, and you gave a great, um, I think you gave a very good magic wand. I mean, we've talked so much about the barriers, right? And we, But we've also talked about there's so many people in, in this audience who are already um, really overcoming those barriers from pilot to scale, um, you know, I think from scale to sustainability even less. Um, we're seeing the three Ps. Um, what, what additionally do you want to leave the audience with that we haven't talked about yet to just, um, that, that they need to think about, that they perhaps, if we haven't covered it, that they would like to consider? Yeah, I'll, I'll echo the, um, I, I think Ken said it better than I could, it's, it's a shared enterprise, right? So how do we get scale and sustain, sustainability through partnership? Uh, I think sustainable enterprise is a, is a great framing. Um, it's only two words too, so. Z, thank you so much for sharing this with us. We're very grateful, and thank you to our audience.